Thank you. Thank you all very much. Um, I have to say that I am sort of a little bit overwhelmed and sort of beyond honored to be here tonight to speak with these two extraordinary, gifted, brilliant filmmaker historians. And they are also two of my very closest friends. So it's just sort of an out-of-body experience, to tell you the honest truth. Um, I just thought I would explain a little bit about how I ended up here, which is that I have had the very rare privilege of working with both Ken and Rick. When I came to Florentine Films in 1989, they were finishing up the editing of what would become this luminous, groundbreaking masterpiece, The Civil War. And I have to say, I will never forget my first few weeks sitting in the back of the edit room on West 44th Street, very quietly watching Ken and Rick, along with their extraordinary writer, Jeff Ward, and virtuoso editor, Paul Barnes, discuss and work through the few remaining creative and intellectual challenges they face in putting that film together. And I, I just could not believe the tremendous intellectual firepower, the bottomless creativity, the passion for getting the story right, and the determination to just make it perfect that was to do with the big picture and every little detail. I, I had never been in a room as interesting as that, this tiny little room on West 44th Street. I was inspired, I was intimidated, and I never could have imagined that almost 30 years later we would be part of each other's lives and uh, I don't know, I just can't really describe how grateful I am to both of you for everything that you have given to me and the work we've gotten to do together. So, thank you. Um, I do want to say that in case anyone is wondering, we are going to be taking a decided break from the real world, what is happening today in our political environment, the debate, politics, that is not what we're going to be talking about tonight. We are going to take the long view, talk about history, the American project about the stories we tell about ourselves. And maybe in 20 years we'll come back and we will ask these distinguished filmmakers what it all means and how to make sense of the extremely confusing times we are living through. But that is not on the, ta on the table for tonight. Um, I have asked around a few people. I have the opportunity to talk to Ken and Rick. What should I ask them? And pretty much the first question many people have asked and the first question I would like to know the answer to is, how is it possible that the two of you, growing up in the world you grew up in, both ended up making these extraordinary films about American history? What was it about the world you grew up in? What forces shaped you? And I think I will turn to Ken, the older brother, first, and ask you to talk a little bit about what it was you think in your childhood, your family background, Ann Arbor, Michigan, that made you both the great filmmakers that you are. Um. First of all, thank you, Lynn. There are so many people here. This is a tremendous honor from the New York Historical Society. It's great to be on the same stage with my brother, to have Jeff Ward here, the longest collaborator, to have Lynn, Sarah Botstein, two of my four daughters, Sarah and Lily Burns, and my son-in-law, David McMahon, here, and all of you, many of you people I know and our friends. Um, Rick and I are the son of a cultural anthropologist and his wife. Uh, she developed cancer uh, very early in our lives and died when I was 11 and Rick was 10. Uh, it's the seminal, shaping, still continually active event in our lives. And in some ways, uh, what was remarked to me almost 35 years after that, I assume Rick would assume the same kind of thing, is I was reminded by my now late father-in-law that what I did for a living was wake the dead and who was I really trying to wake up? That this pursuit of the past uh, that was not just the dry dates and facts and events but something that had an emotional archeology span to it uh, came from both our cultural anthropologist father who also happened to be an amateur still photographer and my first memory is of him building a dark room in the basement of our tract house in Newark, Delaware and then later, um, after our mother died, he had a fairly strict curfew for a while, uh, but he would allow me to stay up late with him to watch old movies, and I saw my father cry, and I'd never seen him cry, not when my mother was sick, not when she died. And I understood almost instantly that there was a power to film, that it had provided a kind of safe haven for him that permitted something to take place, and I wanted, at age 12, to be a filmmaker. And 
at that point, that meant Alfred Hitchcock or Howard Hawks. And I fortunately went to Hampshire College and fell under the tutelage of Jerome Liebling and Elaine Mays. And they reminded me that there is as much drama in what is and what was as anything the human, human imagination comes up with. And the rest has been trying to make history, trying to understand history with, as Winton put out so eloquently, with a group of people, of people working together. Thank you. Um, so Rick, yeah, what, what do you think you would, you know, help us understand sort of the, I'm interested partly as also the child of an academic family, coming from an academic background, how you made your way to this not exactly academic storytelling and from where you grew up and the same forces obviously shaped you. Yeah, I mean, they, they definitely did. And <clears throat> I think that, you know, for, for me, no more so than for Ken. I sort of came out of my childhood the way Harry Dean Stanton in the movie Paris, Texas kind of walked out of a scorching desert feeling bewildered and deeply chaotic inside and unsure how to put one fo foot forward. Um, and I think that, you know, I felt you know, Ken and I have very similar, very deep wounds, um, which are not healed, um, not at 62 or 61. Um, and you, you know, like everybody, it's, it's garden variety, family, sadness, and difficulty, um, which marked us both. And we spent a very difficult time in our late teens and 20s trying to come to terms with it. My first two choices were to be a drummer in a band called Susie and the Pimps. I still regret the fact, <laughs> in many ways, that I was going to be one. I was not Susie. Um, <laughs> but I, I spent a long time thinking, about 12 years, um, from 1973 to 1985, thinking I was going to be a professor of English. But the whole time, Ken was dealing with the difficulty of being Ken by, you know, Winton put it so well, you know, building with clarity and determination a road forward for himself. And I had no idea that that was going to be my road either. And I can't, I, I really can't sit here and say I would have been a documentary filmmaker um, otherwise. It would have been some other happenstance other than the fact that I was Ken's younger brother. But, you know, he his wounds made him alienate so many people in his early part of his career that what do you do after five or 10 years when you've really pissed everybody off and you still have to have somebody to work with? So Ken in 1985 made me an offer I kind of couldn't refuse and I like to say I would have been drinking Woolite on the Bowery um, if it weren't for him. Um, but what happened in the course of working on a couple films beforehand with Jeff Ward as well and Huey Long, but then in the Civil War, which was just kind of my graduate school um, in documentary filmmaking, was you know this astonishing revelation. Um, you know, sort of sitting next to Ken was sitting next to a radioactive furnace of kind of intensity and more than anything else, like a, a deep commitment. Um, and I think the thing that I saw early on was that if you didn't care, or if he thought you didn't care as much as he did, it would literally enrage him. And he created a kind of a environment which was almost like a kind of artisanal medieval guilt where, you know, and there's plenty of fighting in those guilds as in ours. But it was the example which was so pure and powerful that I just kind of went, I mean, it was just no doubt that that's what I wanted to do. So I want to say, take this opportunity to say, Ken, you know, I love you so much. And, you know, there are plenty of family businesses. So you go into your father's business, your mother's business. Well, I went into my brother's business. Um, and uh, I'm glad you invited me in because it's been, you know, 30 years later or 25 years later. It's been an extraordinary journey for me. And it's defined who I am. So. I appreciate it. Wow. I should leave the stage. <laughs> sure. Um, I, 
one of the things I wanted to get at was sort of the influence you've had on each other. And I thought you've sort of spoken a little bit about that now, but maybe, uh, Ken, would you talk a little bit about what you have learned from working with Rick as well? Rick has a ferocious intellectualism, which is his great strength and his great weakness. Uh, as everyone's strength and weakness is always the same thing. Winton said something to us in jazz that Lynn remembers. He said, sometimes a thing and the opposite of a thing happen at the same time. And it helped to explain the sort of just obviously degrading uh, example of minstrelsy that also revealed uh, curiosity for the other. And the only way you could negotiate the, perhaps the shame of that curiosity of the other race was to degrade it and to make it horrible. But in that essential thing was uh, a kind of yearning for the connection, however forbidden and taboo that might be. And so what the gift that Rick brought was, as Jeff did as well, was the gift of language, of words. And we'd always known that in the beginning were words, traditionally the enemy of filmmakers. We did not feel that. We celebrated words. And there are, um, my early professional life is sort of studded with these kind of pitons, these handholds in that desperate climb up the cliff that represent sentences that Jeff wrote or sentences that Rick wrote. Between 1861 and 1865, Americans made war in each other and killed each other in great numbers, if only to become the kind of country that could no longer conceive how that was possible. That is a sentence Rick wrote 28 years ago. And, um, you know, I've, my whole, my whole life, as much as we make films and the imagery is important, it's the words, you could see that in the, in the pilgrim uh, section that Rick just showed, it's the words, it's the words, it's the sound of the words, it's the accent of the words, it's the pacing, it's the fact that the words become notes and there's whole, half notes and whole notes and sixteenth notes. And so for me, my own life is always a sort of succession of moments, of words, of sentences, of, of paragraphs. And some of the most amazing that um, African Americans were not passive bystanders to the struggle, but active, dedicated, self-sacrificing soldiers in an intensely personal drama of self-liberation. Rick Burns. Beautiful. Yeah. Um, I think I'm interested and probably all of us here are exploring kind of the kinds of sense that's been raised a few times by things people have said tonight in tribute to both of you, but the kinds of questions you're interested in asking about our country and who we are. And I think you're, you're sort of working parallel and sometimes overlapping and intersecting lines, but also have slightly different angles on this question. So Rick, I wanted to ask you, you know, what, there seem to be sort of fault lines in our national story and sort of a distance between the myth and the reality that seems to fascinate you. And I thought maybe you could talk a little bit about why that is and how you've gotten at it. In any one of your wonderful films you care to choose to talk about this, there's so many different ways, but it's a central thread that you know, you've explored um, so many times. My roommate in college, a wonderful guy named Michael Lehman, noticed when he saw Ken on TV, interviewed you know, so many times, this is 10 or 15 years ago, um, he said to me, you know, every time I see Ken on TV, he says, all my questions, all my films ask, ask the question, who are we as a people? And so my friend Michael said, Rick, what, you should have a line like that. <laughs> and I said, you know, I'm not on TV as much as Ken is, Michael. <laughs> you know, Ken's got to be prepared for that kind of thing. He goes, no, 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 I, I think you really should. I think what you should say, <laughs> when you're asked what your films are about, you should say, all my films ask the question, Ken, who are we as a people? <laughs> Um, you know, the Harry Dean Stanton um, sort of apocalypse boy in me kind of is really, really, really drawn to moments of change and transfiguration in individual lives, in um, group lives, um, where you can sort of see how the forces are compelling you in, but it turns out that you have no real control over them and they can change you, and they can destroy you, um, they can certainly transfigure you. 
And so, um, although we didn't come from a particularly religious background, I have come to feel that the projects that I've been drawn to are moments of great individual or collective transfiguration in which people realize they're not in Kansas anymore, they don't know, there's no compass anymore that works, whether they're the Donner Party or the Pilgrims, and that no matter what they thought they were after in uh, engaging some ambition um, or wagering some enterprise, they were really, really changed by it. And found themselves kind of hanging on to a rope in the middle of a very high seas in the storm of life and had to make something out of it. And that's been the stuff that has been sort of again and again what's kind of pulled me to a story. Thank you. Wow. So I've been thinking a lot about the central questions that have animated your work, which you've also it's been mentioned here today. But I, I'd really love to have you talk a little bit about this question, which I think really runs through every film you've made, which is this idea of this great American promise and whether we can live up to it and whether we have. And I mean, I started to make a list of the films and it was a very long list. So, you know, certainly in terms of jazz, Jackie Robinson, the Civil War, the war, it's a long list, but it's such a complicated question and you've thought about it so much. And I think especially in this particular day and age, we'd like to hear what you think about it. It's interesting, and I think Winton addressed that extraordinarily well and poetically. Yeah. I don't know how you could possibly follow a, a solo like that. <laughs> um, I think Rick is right, you know, that, that in extremis is, uh, he's really drawn to that, and, and so am I at times. We've, we've, fo we've, we've followed the, the rabbit hole into war too many times, into the Civil War, which we swore we'd never do another one. <laughs> and we did it in World War II, and we sort of knew by the end of it that we were inexorably had to do Vietnam, and it's been nearly 10 years since the decision to do Vietnam that we struggled with this thing. And I, I think that's a part of it, that what happens at that moment, the frontiers of where you're alone in the sea or in the snows of the Sierras, or at that moment when, you're, when life is most vivifying, that is to say when violent death could happen at any moment. But I think I am always brought back to the sense of my country as being an entity as well as the individuals. And that a lot of that is trying to debunk a kind of false idea of the promise of the country and to show that the opposite might not also be true, that there is undertow and contradiction, that the heroes were themselves deeply wounded, as Jeff said, of the three Roosevelts, and deeply flawed at the same time. They could also simultaneously, no contradiction in a larger sense, be great heroes, and I like that sort of thing, and I keep bumping up against uh, the, the sort of the mechanics of our falseness, the way in which we sort of elaborately build the facade, as, as Lincoln was talking about, of these ordinary lives, that through repetition we obliterate the fact that none of us get out of here alive. None of us get out of here alive. And we do lots of different things to, to sort of pretend that that doesn't happen. And so you, when you do deal with it, with individuals in tension with a country that is so in love with its own exceptionalism that you come up with two big themes. One is obviously freedom and the huge tension between personal and collective freedom, what I want and what we need. And that's always the rub. And then of course it's race, because we know exactly where we were founded on July 4, 1776, we know what our catechism is, the second sentence, and yet the guy who wrote it owned other human beings and were constantly propelled. And, and I've spent most of my professional life fending off and defending the centrality of race to the American narrative. And I'm sorry to say that I'm not under attack anymore because it's just been proven. I mean, people would say when Obama was elected, will you shut up now? We're there, we're post-racial, and I held up the onion and it's uh, Onion magazine or newspaper, and it said, you know, on his inauguration day, black man given worst job in world. And um, it's been borne out. And, and it has produced in those people who didn't vote for him an extraordinary disturbance that has to do with the just kind of simple pigmentation, and yet it drives us all the time. So there's a, at least, I think what drives me in, in the day-to-day -day stuff is that as Rick was describing, those moments in extremis, the kind of soul-altering events that then produce the nub of transformation. 
but also in a larger sense how those echo against the, the larger uh, body of the rest of us. And it's, it's interesting how much we lie about ourselves and how much we're desperate to find out that it's okay to be complicated, it's okay to have these, that we all share, every one of us here, the kinds of, as Rick said, kind of ordinary family stuff that um, the vicissitudes of life will visit all of us um, despite what we think and what we do and the kind of affects that we uh, acquire to sort of pretend that they don't. And, um, you know, I think it's part of our responsibility in, in the trumpet you'll hear in the, in the intervals between the pictures, um, the way Rick's camera in that uh, second shot just moves back and for, forth over the speaker mimicking the movement of the waves, but also uh, requiring of you a, a secondary attention. It's not enough to just see it and hear it, but it's enough to actually follow it. And that's what we're trying to do, is, is have you follow these bigger questions. Thank you, yeah. Um, I think, you know, we have to wind up, and I, I thought we should talk a little bit about why history is important, just given where we are and what this organization does so beautifully and so importantly, and what you both do what we've done together, um, you know, why we need to keep coming back to history and how it helps us understand ourselves as human beings and our world and our future and our, our past and therefore our future. And I thought I'd give you each a chance to talk a little bit about the projects that you're working on right now, the Chinese Exclusion Act film, which is, to me, not knowing, I've seen the exhibition when it was up, but how extraordinarily relevant that is to what's happening today. What drew you to make that film and what are you finding out? What can we look forward to? Yeah, I mean, my colleagues are here tonight, and I'm so glad that they all are. We've been working for a couple years now on a film about the Chinese Exclusion Act. Um, Louise Mirror first came to me and, um, a number of years ago and said, would you like to do a film about that? Well, the society, the New York Historical Society, undertakes an exhibit. We marched down and talked to the then chairman of the National Endowment of Humanities, Jim Leach, and we all got a little bit of money to get started. Surprise, surprise, Louise's project was filmed fir finished first, but <laughs> ours will be broadcast in, in May when the wonderful exhibit finds a permanent home at the Chinese Historical Society in San Francisco, which is fantastic. I do want to say that, um, you know, this piece of legislation, May 1882, you know, at the very moment when the new immigration was, you know, about to send 24 million people hurtling to American shores, which basically said unequivocally and for the first and only time in American history, this race of people by name and nationality cannot come here and they cannot ever become American citizens. You know, that's the moment when the Statue of Liberty is going up. That's when its hand is in Madison Square. Um, and so, you know, many people are, uh, it's understandable if they ask themselves, how is it that we remember the Statue of Liberty, but we don't remember this extraordinary moment when there was no determination of who could or couldn't come to America before then? You got off the boat. There were no papers. There was no, so if you want to really understand a little bit about who we are as a people, um, Ken, um, you know, to sort of interrogate this story, which tells, seeks volumes about how it was over a period of time that we came to decide we had to become a gatekeeping nation. Um, we are going to make it, make it clear that sometimes we keep, let some people in, sometimes we don't let other people in. Um, then as now, I mean, to read the headlines in the 1880s is to feel that time has stood still for the last 130 years. I mean, white supremacism, um, the Know Nothing movement and resurgence on the West Coast. Um, the total number of Chinese people were 105,000 in a population then 31 million strong. That's two-tenths of 1% of the population. And you would have thought that the entire continent of Asia was about to bigfoot its way across the Pacific and destroy every white job there was in America. So, you hear these stories, and at the, very, at the very least, they kind of recontextualize how you watch CNN, at least to some degree. Right. I, I know we have to end, and I'll be super brief. I, I, we're working on lots of things, and they're the same thing over and over again. So the subjects you saw, Vietnam, that's the next big thing. I, I just want to refer back to give you a sense of history to a film that Lynn and I made a few years ago. And when we would speak about it, 
Um, I like to not tell the subject of it. I would say that we've been working for several years uh, about, on a film about single issue political campaigns that metastasize with horrible unintended consequences. That it's about the demonization of recent immigrant groups to the United States. That it's about smear campaigns during presidential election cycles. And that it's a whole group of Americans who feel they're losing control of their country and want to take it back. And you would say, Ken, you've abandoned history. You're doing something about our contemporary political scene. Why have you done that? And I said, these are only four themes of our film on prohibition. And yes, it's about gangsters. And yes, it's about flappers. And that's dangerous and sexy. But the much more interesting thing is the way the, pre the present moment resonates with the past and that vice versa. And um, that, to me, proves why it's so important to have a New York historical society to keep and preserve the records of this past so that we go back and when a demagogue says X and really you can show with the evidence that it's why we perhaps have the opportunity to save ourselves. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Beautiful. I think Rick, Rick wants, yes, thank you all so much. Rick, Rick, yeah. I, I, I will applaud all of you again and tell you that Ken just made the case for us for history. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. By faith, the elders obtain good report, and through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. Abel, Enoch, Noah, Abraham, Sarah, these all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, and being persuaded of them, and embracing them, and confessing that they were both strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek another country. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to return. But they desired a better country. That is a heavenly one. Wherefore God was not ashamed to be called their God. And he hath prepared for them a city. I think William Bradford knew they were on a journey in this world towards heaven. They didn't know quite how they would get there or where they would finally meet their end. But I think that's what he meant, they were on a journey. They were transient citizens of the world and ultimately citizens of heaven. And they were on a journey towards purity. That's what they sought. That's what took them out of England. That's what took them over to Holland. That's what took them from Holland over to the New World.
summer was fading fast, and the window for attempting the long and dangerous ocean crossing had already started to close, when on September 6, 1620, an aging 180-ton ship called the Mayflower weighed anchor off Plymouth, off the south coast of England, and set out on her own across the North Atlantic on what would prove to be one of the most historic voyages of the millennium. It's worth reminding ourselves that at the time they were a very, very small group of very extreme people. And if we'd never heard of them ever again, nobody would be surprised. And most English people thought that they were well rid of them. The fact that they are in the long term extraordinarily successful, that they found the world's greatest democracy, throws retrospective luster. They are, one might say, if you wanted to be critical, they're religious nutters who won't settle for anything except the most literal reading of the Bible. They want to transform a nation state into something that resembles what they take to be a godly kingdom.